Uh, some of you may not know this. We're a part of a church planting network called Acts 29. Uh, and Cornerstone is one of the church plants you help support through your giving. So everything you give to City of God, 10% goes out to church planting. Uh, and it's been a blessing and a pleasure to uh, support Tyler and see what he is doing in Detroit. Uh, he also, through our church planting network, leads a movement called Church in Hard Places, um, which is helping get plants off the ground in some of uh, the hardest context you can imagine. And so uh, would you join me in welcoming uh, Tyler St. Clair? One of my biggest fears is always uh, walking upstairs for some reason. I've, I've lived in Detroit um, all of my life and have seen and experienced very uh, dangerous things. But I don't know what it is about walking upstairs. Um, <laughs> that's not a joke. That's serious. Um, I'm going to um, say a word of prayer before I jump in. I'm going to be in Psalm 62. So you can flip there, turn there. Um, again, thank you for your partnership in the gospel. It is uh, my pleasure to be here and preach God's word. It is also my pr uh, pleasure to partner in the work of ministry. Um, again, you may not know this, but because of your efforts here, we are able to um, engage in ministry in Detroit. Um, and not the nice, cute part of Detroit. We're in the middle of the neighborhood, and we are seeing God do amazing things. So thank you for your partnership in the Lord Jesus Christ. So um, Psalm 62, and I'm going to open up with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that your word is a double-edged sword. Your word is alive and active. Lord, we pray that your word strengthens, edifies. We pray that your word um, brings encouragement. We pray that your word brings repentance. Lord, we pray that you move mightily through the preaching and teaching of your word. I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Lord, I pray that you are uh, glorified. I pray that we are all edified. Pray this in Christ's name. Amen. So I um, would like to speak on the topic of rest. Rest. Title of this message is simply Rest in God. I um, felt through some prayer, I, I felt compelled to this topic and this particular psalm um, because 2020 has been uh, a year. It's been a year. It's been an interesting year. This has been a wild ride. This has been a year I would like a refund on at the end of this year. I'm going to rate it one star. 2020 is going to get a one star rating. But in all seriousness, there, this has been a year of Turbulence, stress, this has been a, a year where we have seen civil uprising. This has been a year of, of great political angst. And, uh, oh, by the way, there is a worldwide pandemic we are all living in the midst of and, and, and affected by. So I, I felt compelled to encourage us, encourage myself today to run to the Lord Jesus Christ to find rest for our weary souls. So he, here's my big idea. I'm going to tell you right out the gate, right, right, put my cards right on the table. My big idea, my main point of this message is your soul can rest in restless situations if your soul is resting in Jesus Christ. Your, your soul can rest, your heart, your mind can rest in restless situations and in restless times if your soul is resting in Jesus Christ. So in Psalm 62, we see David, and he explains how and why he is at rest in a turbulent situation. This isn't a time of peace. This isn't a, a, a time of ease. This isn't a time of leisure. He, he is in the midst of a turbulent situation, yet he is at rest in his Lord. Three reasons I see in Psalm 62. Th three reasons I see for rest. First, we can rest because the Lord is our security. First reason, we can rest because the Lord is our security. We don't know the exact occasion or the origin of Psalm 62, but we can clearly see that David is facing active or potential aggression from his enemies. Psalm 62, verse 3. 
How long will you threaten a man? Psalm 62, verse uh, 3. How long will you threaten a man? Will all of you attack as if he were a leaning wall or a tottering fence? They only plan to bring him down from his high position. They take pleasure in lying. They bless with their mouths, but they curse inwardly. Selah. The setting of Psalm 62 is David is yet again uh, experiencing the attack of his enemies, but this time it is those within. These are people in his inner circle plotting his demise. These enemies are not foreigners, but these were men who were close to David at one point in time. They took pleasure in lying and desired to knock him off his position. I believe the proper term for these people are frenemies. Routinely in David's writing, David would pray and he he would ask the Lord to eliminate. He would ask the Lord to remove his enemies or he would ask the Lord to avenge him, but not so in Psalm 62. What, What makes Psalm 62 so unique is there is none of that. There's no request. There's no petition in this psalm. And David does not even cry out for help. He acknowledges the threat of his enemies but he's confidently resting in God despite the storm swirling around him. So surrounding um, verses three and four, we have verse one, two, and then we have verse five and six. So, So verses one, two, five, and six, these are the hook of Psalm 62. Every good song has a good hook. Every good song has a chorus. Listen to the hook of Psalm 62. Verse one. I am at rest in God alone. My salvation comes from him. Verse 2, he alone is my rock and my salvation, my stronghold. I will never be shaken. Verse 5, rest in God alone, my soul, for my hope comes from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation and my stronghold. I will not be shaken. Again, this is the hook. This is the chorus. And the two key words in this hook are rest and alone. Rest and alone. That that word rest means to be still. It means to be silent. Please hear this. So so this rest is not a, uh, uh, is not an indifference. It's not, I'm going to close my eyes and ignore what's going on. This, this rest is not apathy. This rest is not indifference. David has an inward uh, silence, an a inward peace, despite the difficulty that he is facing. The idea for rest here is an inward quietness instead of fear, instead of anxiety, instead of stress, instead of inner turmoil, David is at peace. The first key word is rest. The second key word is alone. Alone points to the Lord being the only source, the only reason for his stillness. Pastor James Montgomery Boyce put it this way. Our problem is not that we don't trust God. The problem is we often don't trust God alone. Can I repeat that? The problem is not that we don't trust God. We have faith in God, but the problem is very often we don't trust in God alone. We trust in God plus our employment. We trust in God plus other people. We trust in God and money. We trust in God and the idols we cling to. We trust in God and politics. We trust in God and uh, desirable circumstances. Shall I go on? I think you got my point. The, The hook of Psalm 62, David is at rest. And the single reason that David is at rest is not desirable circumstances. He's in the midst of a storm, but the reason is he is in at rest in God alone. Verse five lets us uh, appear into a inner conversation. We we're able to, to eavesdrop on David's inner monologue. Rest in God alone, my soul, for my hope comes from him. Verse five, he is settling his soul. He's settling his heart. He's reassuring himself to trust in God. Here, David is modeling something that we should do. David is modeling how we should continually bring our hearts, bring our minds, uh, bring our entire being to rest 
in the Lord of our salvation, especially in difficult times. We must routinely bring our hearts and our minds to rest in Christ. Notice this. After this conversation, after this inner monologue, after he encourages himself, he's even more solidified in his trust in the Lord. Let me read verse 5, 6, and 7 again. Verse 5, 6, and 7. Rest in God alone, my soul. He's talking to himself. For, for my hope comes from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation and my stronghold. I will not be shaken. Verse 7. My salvation and glory depend on God, my strong rock. My refuge is in my God. After quieting his heart, David is further convinced, further solidified in the salvation of the Lord, and he says, I will not be shaken. Please hear this. Please hear this. This inner quietness, this inner rest that David has wasn't because of the circumstances changing. We often think the circumstances have to change. We often think that things have to, quote, get better. He's resting. He has peace in the Lord, not because things got better. David is repeating the same phrases over and over again. My rock, my stronghold, my refuge. These three metaphors point to safety, security, and strength. This is a perfect metaphor for a man who uh, spent 13 to 15 years of his life living in a cave on the run from King Saul. I believe much of our inner unrest... Much of our anxiety, much of our inner struggle is because we are hoping on things that will shake. David said, I will not be shaken because you are my refuge. You are my stronghold. You are my strength. You are my rock. But often we put that trust in things that will shake. Friends, everything and everyone around you will shake sooner or later. Your career will shake. Your your family will shake. Relationships definitely shake. Your physical health will shake. Everything will shake around you. Like David, we can withstand the storms of life. We can withstand the shaking of life if we cling to this rock of ages and make God our refuge. All right, Pastor, I hear you. That sounds good. That that sounds really good. But you have no idea what I'm facing. You, You have no idea what I'm going through right now. You don't know. You're not in my situation. You you don't know what I'm facing tomorrow. How can we find rest? in these difficult, troubling times. I believe we can quiet ourselves. I believe we can find rest two practical ways. First, meditation. First first way we can uh, find rest, first way we can quiet our souls is meditation. Listen to Psalm 1, one of my favorite psalms. Psalm 1, verse 1. Psalm 1. How happy is the one who does not walk in the advice of the wicked or stand in the pathway with sinners or sit in the company of mockers. Instead, his delight is in the Lord's instruction. He meditates on it day and night. What happens? What what happens to this person that meditates on the goodness of the Lord, who meditates on the Lord's instruction? Uh, uh, what, What is the result? Verse 3, Psalm 1, verse 3. He is like a tree planted beside the flowing streams that bear fruit in its season and whose leaves does does not wither. And whatever he does prosper. Psalmist would go on to say the wicked is not so, but, but the wicked is like a chaff and they're just blown away. I believe so much of our inner anxiety, so much of our inner stress, so much of our inner turmoil is because we uh, allow what's going on around us to consume our hearts and our minds. We dwell in doubt. 
We, we, we wallow in worry. We focus on fear, and we constantly think about our troubles, and then we wonder why we can't sleep. We, 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 we wonder why we are a wreck. We're meditating on that instead of meditating on the Lord's instruction. So often our, our meditation becomes possible scenarios and possible outcomes, and we neglect to meditate on the goodness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice this. Again, David is not, he, he's not closing his eyes and ignoring the situation. He, he's not living in la-la land. He acknowledges the threats of his enemies in verse 3 or 4. But instead of focusing on the threat, instead of focusing on the issue, instead of focusing on the trouble, what does he focus on? His refuge, his rock, his stronghold, his fortress, his hope, his salvation. He mentions his problem. They're coming after me again. But I'm at rest. Why am I at rest? He's my hope. He's my refuge. He's meditating. He's reminding himself of the Lord and his goodness. What are you meditating on today? What, what is the thought that you're trying to bat out of your mind right now while I'm talking? What, what problem were you thinking about on your way here and that's still tugging for your attention while we're attempting to worship the Lord? What are you meditating on what if we took that, that time and that energy, and, and instead, instead of meditating on what's wrong, what's going on, what we're facing, says, he's my rock. He's my fortress. He's my hope. He's my salvation. I will not be shaken. What if we meditated on the Lord? Secondly, silence. Silence. Silence and stillness. Psalm 36 I'm, excuse me, Psalm 37, verse 7. Psalm 37, verse 7. Be silent before the Lord and wait expectantly on him. Please hear this. Please hear this. Please hear this. Please hear this. Spiritual maturity and spiritual fruitfulness is not found in frenetic activity. It's not found in doing more. You're not more spiritual because you do more things. Sometimes... The greatest way we can express our faith. So, sometimes the, the, the way that we can show the world and show ourselves that we are trusting in the Lord Jesus is by doing nothing and waiting on him. Psalm 46 verse 10 tells us to be still and know that I am God. You're not God. You're not sovereign. You can't change your situation. You can't change your circumstances. Be still and wait for me. I believe much of our inner restless, much of, much of Tyler's inner restlessness is because I'm constantly moving. I'm constantly doing things. I'm constantly thinking. I'm constantly meditating on what's wrong, what's next, what's tomorrow, instead of taking time to meditate on the Lord and to be still in his presence. How often are you just still in silence before the Lord? Let me ask you this question. How often do you put your phone on do not disturb and go in the other room and give the Lord your undivided attention? How often do you detach yourself from technology, detach yourself from the media, just so you can stop hearing that noise and hear the voice of your Savior? How often are you still? How often do you give the Lord your undivided attention? First, we can rest because the Lord is our security. Secondly, we can rest because the Lord is trustworthy. The Lord is trustworthy. Verse 7, Psalm 62, verse 7. Psalm 62, verse 7. My salvation and glory depend on God. My strong rock, my refuge is in God. Trust in him at all times. You people pour out your hearts before him. God is our refuge. David is constantly reassuring himself that salvation, that deliverance, that security come from God and God alone. 
I believe part of our problem, part of my problem is I look for salvation. I look for deliverance. I look for security in other places. The Prince of Preachers, Charles Spurgeon, put it this way. If to wait on God is worship, then to wait on the creature is idolatry. One way that we express our, our trust is in God, our, 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 our trust, our hope, our faith. One way we express that is by pouring out our hearts in prayer. Notice what he says, says, trust in him at all times. You people, pour out your hearts before him. God is our refuge. Family, prayer is so important. Prayer is so vital because we can place our fears, we can place our concerns, we can place, place our doubts, we can place what we're wrestling with in the sovereign hand of God. Because God alone is our rock. God alone is our salvation. He should be where we take our concerns. You can be vulnerable. You can be weak. You can cry. You can express your need because, again, he is the place of safety. He is our deliverance and our hope. Like, like David, our faith and our trust should be placed in God and God alone. Proverbs 3, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. And in all your ways, acknowledge him. And what will happen? What will happen? What happens if you trust in him? What, what happens if you acknowledge him? He will direct your path. By his grace, the Lord, is, he will lovingly direct and lovingly show us the right way once we put our trust in him and we pour out our hearts to him. Where's your trust today? Are, is your trust in your own ingenuity? Is your trust in your own ability to figure it out? Is your trust in your own strength? Or is in your trust in the, the sovereign Lord of the universe that predestined your entire life and that holds it in your hands, in his hands? Thirdly, we can trust, I mean, we can rest in God because of the Lord's strength. First, the Lord is our security. Secondly, the Lord is trustworthy. Third, the Lord is strong. Verse 9, Psalm 62, verse 9. Common people are only a vapor. Important people, an illusion. Together on the scale, they weigh less than a vapor. Place no trust in oppression or false hope in robbery if wealth increases. Don't set your heart on it. After encouraging us to trust in the Lord alone, David gives us two examples of where not to trust, where, where not to anchor your soul, where not to put your trust. It says, don't put your trust in humans and don't put your trust in material wealth. Verse 9, he says, common people are a vapor. Even important people are an illusion. David is pointing to the, the frailty and the limitations that humans possess. Family, the, even the, the, the longest life you can imagine is just a blink in God's eternal eye. The greatest men and women we celebrate will eventually experience this vapor going out. I believe that we're often restless, we're often anxious because we are looking for something. Please hear this. We are looking for something that only God can deliver, only God can provide in people. Our family, our spouses, our friends, our spiritual leaders, these people are a gift from God. They are a means of his grace, but they're limited. Ultimate security, ultimate trust can only be found in Christ. Place no trust in oppression or false hope in robbery. If wealth increases, do not set your heart on it. David is instructing those, not, th those around him not to trust in extortion and robbery and accumulating power and accumulating wealth. Wealth and power are, are two subtle idols that people routinely cling to, especially in difficult times. 
Many people are building their lives under the false assumption that accumulating wealth, accumulating power will bring security. David is instructing us not to make wealth the center of our lives, but God himself. Instead of putting your confidence in limited humans and putting your your ultimate confidence in wealth and power, we are to trust in God alone. Listen to how he concludes this psalm, Psalm 62, verse 11. He concludes, God has spoken once, I have heard this twice. Strength belongs to God, and faithful love belongs to you, Lord, for you will repay each according to his works. Please hear this. So, so David concludes this psalm by telling them that they can rest, they can trust and God and God alone because of his strength and his faithful love. It says, strength belongs to you and faithful love belongs to you, O Lord. Salvation, he mentions salvation in verses 1, 2, 6, and 7. He constantly refers to the Lord being his salvation. It says, because of his strength, his unlimited strength and the faithful love that he possesses, David sees salvation in God. Brothers and sisters, Jesus Christ is the very epitome of the Lord's strength and the Lord's faithful love. We look no further for faithful love, the faithful love of God and the the unlimited strength. Look no further than the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 5, verse 6. Romans 5, verse 6 and 8. For while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. But he proved his own love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 1 John chapter 3 says, what great love the Father has lavished. He poured out this great love. How did he do it? By making us the children of God. We see the faithful, unstoppable, unwavering love of God displayed on the cross through the Son of God. Who became our salvation. We were helpless. We were dead in sin. We were hopeless. We were separated from from the Father, and we were doomed to eternity in hell. But love drove Jesus to the cross. Love drove Jesus to be mocked. Love drove Jesus to be tortured and crucified in our place for our sins, for our salvation. It was the faithful love of God that led the Son to accept the wrath of his Father in our place to become our salvation. It was love that welcomed wayward sinners into the family of God to become his righteous sons and daughters. But it wasn't just love. It says, strength belongs to you. Not only did Jesus possess love, but Jesus possessed the power to redeem us. The mighty hand of God snatched the Lord Jesus from the grave three days later. Through his death and resurrection, the Lord Jesus overpowered and defeated death, sin, and Satan. Paul puts it this way at the end of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Death has become swallowed up in victory. Death, where is your sting? O death, where is your victory? But thanks be to God, he gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to conclude here with these words from the Lord Jesus. Jesus gives a beautiful invitation. Please hear this. This is an invitation that Jesus is offering. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Don't this, don't, please, don't, please hear this. Don't just hear this as uh, uh, we're reading a Bible passage. Yes, we're reading a Bible passage, but hear this as the Lord's invitation to you today. Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened. That's me. I will give you rest. This is a promise. Take my yoke and learn from me because I am lowly and humble in heart. And you will find rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy 
and my burden is light. Notice this. No, please hear this. Jesus equates salvation. Jesus equates following him to rest, not activity. Please hear this. He equates salvation following him to rest, not activity, not doing more. He equates following him and accepting what he accomplished, accepting the finished work through his death and resurrection. That's rest. Following him isn't just doing more. It's accepting what he accomplished in the first place. Friends, this is the gospel. Our souls can be at rest in this life because of the eternal life that Jesus provided through his death and resurrection. Again, our souls can rest in restless situations if our souls are resting in Christ. The gospel is resting in what Jesus accomplished once and for all, not in what we do, not in what we face in this life. This is a beautiful invitation. Come, if you're weary, if you're anxious, if you're fretful, if you're full of fear, come. Jesus is inviting you today. St. Augustine rightfully concluded, you have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our heart is restless until it rests in you. Are you resting in Jesus today? Are you resting in Jesus? Will you accept this invitation of the Lord Jesus? I'm going to pray and invite Pastor Eric up. Father, we are thankful that anything we face in this life is under your sovereign uh, care. We can rest. We can have peace. We, we, we don't have to be slaves to fear, anxiety, doubt, and worry. We don't have to be slaves to the, 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 the swinging winds of culture and what's going on around us. But despite all of that, we can truly rest in you. Father, I pray that we all accept this invitation of our Savior to come and find rest in him. Pray this in Christ's name. Amen.